Hey everybody, today I'm going to take on some questions that I get all the time about upgrading speakers that involves swapping out drivers. Before I get into that though, I want to thank Frank up in New Jersey for sending me a bunch of cool soccer shirts. This is one of them and I like it. Thanks Frank, my man. All right, Frank always is my man when he calls. We like Frank. Now, People contact me all the time asking me if they can upgrade a speaker XYZ and can we swap the woofers out to something better. And especially with vintage speakers, have guys asking me, can we swap out these drivers to some better drivers? No, no, it's it's not that easy. It's really hard just to find two woofers that have the same frame. You'd almost have to go to the same manufacturer to find something that's the exact same frame. All the frames are different. All the recesses, the mounting depths, everything are different. And then even if you did find one that you could retrofit into the box, the teal small parameters are typically different, so they require different air spaces. And on top of that, I have guys asking me, well, if I just retrofit the box, I mean, if the air space is close enough, will you think the old crossover will work? No, no, it won't. Chances of it having even the, any capability of mounting in the same holes and having the same frequency response where you don't have to change the crossover, zero chances of that happening. I mean, anytime you swap out any driver, the frequency response from one driver to the next will be so different, it will require a whole new crossover to be designed to incorporate it into that new design. I even have guys with vintage speakers saying, hey, can we just swap out all these drivers to newer model drivers and I'll, I'll figure out a way to get it mounted and, and then send it to you for you to design a crossover for it. Well, if you're going to buy all new drivers, don't throw them in a vintage box. I mean, there's a reason that we've gone to these narrow baffles and not a big wide shoebox shaped speaker that sits on the floor. I mean, we value now imaging and soundstage layering and minimizing the surface reflections around the drivers so that the speaker will project more of a three-dimensional image and a deep and layered soundstage. And when you have a big wide baffle and drivers mounted on something that's got a lot of surface reflection, it really detracts from the, it, you know, it makes everything sound like it's playing from there forward. So um, if you've got an old vintage speaker, sometimes it's worth restoring those speakers and sometimes for nostalgic reasons there's sentimental value there to to restore a, an original speaker and to do some of those things but as far as looking for performance if you've got to buy all new drivers just buy one of our kits you'll be performance ahead and money's ahead by the time you buy all new drivers then you have to send it to us in a box and the shipping for that and then i have to design something that's a one-off which means I can't sell 30 more of them to everybody else that has the same speaker to recoup the time that I spend doing the design work. I have to charge you for that design work and the parts, and you've spent twice as much as you would have if you had just bought one of our kits. So chances of that working out are pretty much just zero almost. You know, just It's not worth it. However, this is one of those times. This is one of those times where we were able to take an old speaker, and turn it around and make something out of it. If you remember, I did a video uh, some time ago on the Vienna Acoustics Mozart and the Vienna Acoustic Mozart Grand. And we were shocked at how the Mozart measured pretty well and was a good candidate for upgrades, but the Mozart Grand, which should have been grander, was it was a disaster. Um, we couldn't even salvage it. These these little woofers had frequency response. It was so bad that it was beyond fixing. It didn't even make any sense. And we said, no, start over. It's better to completely start over. And we've had this sitting around for a while. The owner has had some medical issues and wasn't interested in having to send it back right away. Now he's he's recovered and he's asked us to revisit this and to figure out what we can do with it. And in the meantime, we've had... Because of that video, a whole bunch of other customers call us about the same speaker, and they're hearing the same things that 
we were showing with the frequency response measurements. So um, we've revisited it. And I'm going to briefly go through how it looked at the beginning and why it was not a good candidate for an upgrade. And then what we were able to do to it to make it into something that actually is an upgrade. And it's an easy something we can send out to you guys that own the Vienna Acoustic Mozart Grand, which was $1,000 more than the Mozart, which was crazy because the Mozart was such a better speaker. The Mozart used the same tweeter, but it had two woofers, one here, one here. They shared the same airspace, and it had a pretty reasonable response. It just needed some help, and the parts quality was pretty poor. So it was an easy upgrade. This one, um, the, the drivers are in individual spaces, same tweeter, but just different woofers. And why they went to this woofer, I have no idea. Um, let's look at the on-axis frequency response of this thing. This is it. This is the on-axis response. And I had some people that, uh, once they saw that, said, there's something wrong there. That, that can't be right. You, you're measuring it wrong, or you've got a bad one, or there's some bad drivers, or something's not right. Well, some of the other guys who watched the video and saw those measurements uh, responded. And one sent a measurement that he got from the manufacturer. In-house measured this speaker, had this frequency response measurement, and sent it to this particular customer. And let's look at them together. Our frequency response measurement versus the factory measurement. Now, the scaling is a little differently, a little different. Theirs is a little broader, so it looks not as rough. But if you take that into account and you chop off from 200 hertz and down, it looks almost identical to the measurement that we've got in this thing. They're splicing the low frequency range in from about 400 hertz and down, or 300 hertz and down, they're splicing in a near-field response in order to make this extended full-range response. We don't do that. We don't worry about doing that. We can easily calculate what's going on below 200 hertz, and we don't usually do near-field measurements and then start splicing it in because it's really just a guess because you're just adjusting amplitudes to where it looks like it crosses and fits, and it's it's not a real measurement. So... We don't really do it. It doesn't really tell us that much. Uh, but they did that here. And so it looks different in that regard. But everywhere else, it looks exactly the same. So uh, also the very top end is completely fallen off in the factory measurements. I don't know if maybe their mic wasn't calibrated to measure any higher or what's going on. Tweeters don't typically drop off that sharply. So I don't know what was going on there. We didn't measure it falling off at the top end that badly at all. Um, even if they were off axis, it wouldn't be this abrupt, this sharp. And we would see that in the rest of the response. So I don't know what's going on there, but the rest of the measurement looks exactly like ours. Now let's look at, um, well, let's, before we look at the woofer's response alone, let's look at the rest of the frequency response measurements of it from the factory. Let's look at the spectral decay right off the bat. You can see some of those peaks in the woofer's response are horrendous and there's ringing going on there. There's just a long line of just breakup and just keeps going. This would be incredibly hard to listen to because of that. Uh, the vertical off axis um, has a little bit of a dipped area at the crossover point, but it's minor compared to how rough the frequency response is already. Same with the horizontal off axis. It drops off evenly in the in the horizontal plane, but it was already rough to begin with. And the impedance response on this thing um, looks like it dropped down to three ohms. So they had these some of these woofers wired in parallel, at least down low, and it had a pretty low impedance curve. Uh, let's look at the individual driver measurements. Um, let's start with the tweeter because it's not as bad. If we look at the tweeter's response, um, it plays down fairly low, but you can't use it down that low because there's a huge dip right at about 3,200 hertz is where it's centered. And even if you bring the top or bring the lower range of the tweeter down a little bit, you still have to contend with that big dip. So you really can't use it below... 3000 Hertz very well because of the response that it has. So it's got a little bit of a limited range, but it's usable. Let's look now at 
the upper woofer and the lower woofer's response. Oh, man. This is rough, and this is exactly why we couldn't do anything with it. I mean, that's the frequency response measurement of this little woofer. It's a polymer frame, uh, shielding cup on it. Makes it look like it's got a big motor structure on it, but it's not. There's a little magnet there with a little bucking magnet and a shielding cup. Why this was shielded, I don't know. A speaker like this really doesn't need to be shielded. It's not going to be set next to an old tube-type television for you to need it to be shielded, so I don't know what's going on there. So we came up with an idea of how to salvage this thing, and Hobbs, who works for me, has a 3D printer, and he took some measurements on this thing and figured out how to make a little adapter ring that would allow us to mount our M130 woofer in that hole, which it needed about the same airspace, and it kind of fits the hole after we drop in this little adapter ring to fill this gap and give it a flush seat. Now, our little M130 has a beautiful response curve, rolls off naturally really smooth, and usually only needs two parts. Second order filter, and it looks fantastic. Um, polymer chassis, so no, no transmitting resonance to the enclosure. And it has just a beautiful sound to it. The, the mid-range and the vocal range in this thing, fantastic. So we're able to put M130s, top and bottom. And let's look at what I was able to do with this thing. Let's look at the new frequency response. Pretty smooth, huh? Yeah, it looks good. Um, let's look at the frequency response of the drivers individually and how they sum. You'll notice I was able to extend that tweeter's range down just as far as I could. I got it to cross at 3,000. Had to allow the M130 to play out a little further to reach it, which was no problem. And the lower M130 is just covering the very lowest frequency range by itself. So only the tweeter's crossing here. And it's getting a little helper down low. Let's look at the horizontal off axis. Looks fantastic. Smooth as can be. Really good horizontal off-axis. The vertical off-axis looks okay. We start seeing a little dip there as we start moving up higher in, in the off-axis. Um, that's because the crossover point is way up there at 3,000 hertz. Typically, when we cross our tweeters to this thing, like our T26s, we'll cross at 1,800 or 2,000 hertz. And the wavelengths are so much longer there that as you move up in height, you're not making very much phase rotation at that frequency versus at 3000 Hertz. The wavelengths are almost half the length. And so you don't have to move as far uh, from one driver versus the other for them to start arriving out of time and then causing that little bit of a dip there. So that's what's going on there. Looking at the spectral decay, it's pretty clean, uh, really clean overall. Tweeter's got a little bit of, of a hash there at the top. A little bit of something going on there at the bottom of the uh, the range, and it could be we needed to add a little more insulation inside to completely get that out of it. But overall, frequent, uh, spectral decay looks really clean. And um, the impedance looks really good now. It only has a minimal dip of four and a half ohms right at the tuning frequency of that port uh, or of the ports that are on the back. So uh, that worked out really well. It's more balanced now. And we try to keep this parts cost down as much as possible. I've got two different levels of this kit that we can do. Uh, keep in mind the kit includes four of our M130 woofers, all new wiring, a set of tube connectors to replace these cheesy binding posts that are on the back of this thing. It includes four of these adapters that we 3D print so that you can swap this stuff out. And with all poly caps, all air core inductors from US coils, uh, the caps are J, mostly JB poly caps, and there is a bypass cap in the tweeter circuit, a little sonic cap, um, to improve the clarity and the detail levels of the tweeter without spending a lot of money. So that whole kit came to $525 for everything you need, and then we did a version of it where instead of just the poly caps, we use sonic caps on the tweeter circuit, which should bring the detail and resolution levels up another notch. That's $618 for that full upgrade, and that will transform a broken speaker with nice-looking cabinets into an actually great-sounding little speaker. Good sensitivity, um, almost 89 to 90 dB sensitivity. I'd call it 89.5 dB sensitivity. 
So easy enough to get good output levels out of. And M130s always sound fantastic. And it'll work well with this tweeter. So great sounding little upgrade. It was a rare moment that we could pull off an upgrade on something where we're having to swap out drivers and still make it affordable and make it work. So like I said, one of those rare occasions when we made it happen. That's it for this video. Um, thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't. I do appreciate all you guys who subscribe to our channel. And I will see you guys in the next video.